Fritzing parts fast, PCB view. Usually when you want to get something made, you need an engineering drawing. Well, the PCB view is that engineering drawing. It's just that it's simplified by not displaying dimensions, because the drawn objects are one-to-one -one real life, making the objects themselves the dimensions and positions. And because the drawing needs to be accurate for parts to fit, you can't draw it without a data sheet with dimensional footprint or a sample to measure it off. So make sure you have one of those and that you draw it accurately, or you'll be wasting time and money reordering PCBs again. This is drawn wrong, but you'll know how to fix it by the end of this. As an example, if you draw this part and it's 0.1 of a mil out, and you stack 10 together, the last pin will be out by 1 millimeter and won't fit. So use the data sheet and draw it correctly. The PCB drawing is easy in one way, in that you don't have to draw as much stuff, but there's more rules, so it's a bit trickier. And the biggest rule for Fritzing to accept the PCB SVG is the grouping format and their ID names. Fritzing needs a group ID name so it knows what to do with the contents inside it. And it needs the groups in this format. Silkscreen and a copper group with a copper group inside it. We'll start with our silkscreen. And if there's stuff inside it but it doesn't show, that's because it's white on a white background. White was the old Fritzing format. If the objects are strokes, just hold the shift key down and click on the black box. If objects are fill, like text should be, just click on the black without the shift. Silkscreen is what the name suggests, any silkscreen that's on the part. Things like border boxes, lines, text, logos, basically anything that's not a copper pad or a drilled hole. Next we have our copper groups, and anything in copper 1 will be etched on the top layer of your PCB. And everything in copper 0 will be etched on the bottom layer of your PCB. But because copper 0 is inside copper 1, anything in copper 0 will be duplicated in copper 1. So it will be on both the bottom and top layer of the PCB. This saves time because you only have to put your object in the inner copper group if you want them on both layers. This rectangle is in copper 1, which is something like an SMD footprint, and this circle is in copper 0, like a through-hole part. We turn our SVG into a fritzing part and export it as a Gerber, then we open it in a Gerber viewer, I use Gerb V, and we can see our part. Now watch what happens when I turn off the top layer and make it invisible. Our rectangular pad only in the copper 1 top layer disappears, and the top layer of our through-hole ring disappears showing our copper ring bottom layer. And this shows the object only in the internal copper group being duplicated top and bottom. The other rule, which I'll cover later when we draw our actual pads and rings, is make sure they are a rectangle or a circle. You can actually use paths, but sometimes that brings in errors into ring circles. We'll continue with our 100 pin part as an example and do our PCB drawing. Method 1 is the same shortcut method we used in video 1, which used Fritzing generated drawings pasted into our drawing. We set up Inkscape with File, then Document Properties, then set the drawing dimensions to millimetres. Inches is also fine, but don't use pixels or any of the others or it scales weirdly when it goes into fritzing. Turn off border shadow, then it's grids, rectangular, new. Select millimetre, inches fine too, and punch in an arbitrary size for the grid. I'm using 10 millimetre. Then zoom into the top left corner with the plus button. Next we set up these four snap buttons on the side here. After that we open these dialog boxes and it's object, the fill and stroke dialog, and the transform dialog. Next we rectangle select, we click on the 00 origin of our part and drag out any size rectangle. With our fill and stroke dialog box, we want no fill, but we want stroke. Then in stroke style we select inch, and punch in a width of 12 thou. We measure 97mm by 66mm, while the rectangle is still selected we hit the arrow button. So we punch in 97 for the width, and 66 for the height. The outside of the stroke is now the hard limit for our part, but you could add the stroke to the height and width so you have a 12th hour clearance for manufacturing inaccuracies. Now we have to zero the origin point of our rectangle. When you draw a line snapping to the grid, the stroke width straddles the grid line. This offsets the rectangle half a stroke. To fix that, select the rectangle while the arrow button is selected, and then it's just zero for X and zero for Y. Your rectangle should now be within the grid. Now we have to shrink this page size down, and it's edit, and resize page to selection. Next we need two rows of 25 pins, and like in part 1, we get Fritzing to draw it for us. Grab a header, we select 50 pins, we select double rows, we rotate using the button down here, right click, edit part, we go to PCB, file, show in folder, then the usual copy and paste somewhere. We open our SVG in Inkscape, and the first thing we look at is our silk screen. If the silk screen is not visible, just hold the shift key down and click on the black, and then you can decide if you want to keep it or not. Generally, fritzing parts in the PCB view you don't have superfluous silkscreen, but that's up to you. Next, we have to find pin 0 and orientate this path the same as in the other drawings. Basically, if pin PA3 is connector number 6 in one drawing, PA3 has to be connector 6 in all drawings. Pin and terminal need to be the same number. I need to rotate this 90 degrees clockwise, so with the arrow button selected, we box select it, transform, 
rotate 90 degrees apply we now have to zero zero it but we'll select inches first then it's zero in x and zero in y we look at our xml editor and zero is where we want it if we now look at the xml editor we see a bunch of pins with id numbers a bunch of plain circles and a bunch of pins with ids again these plain circles are duplicates so you can either leave them or delete them i'm going to delete them so i select it and hit the delete button we are missing circle pin 23, but we have an unmarked circle in position 23. So while pin 24 is selected, we click on its ID and select copy. We select the plain circle in position 23 and just paste it. We change the 24 to 23 and hit enter. We select new pin 23 and move it one slot up so the number order is correct. We have pins 0 to 49 in order here. Now we need a second set of 50 pins, but if we duplicate here, Inkscape will reset all our pin IDs to plain circles. Basically, it doesn't allow duplicate ID names. To get around that, we select our base copper group and we copy and paste it to another drawing. And the first thing we do is zero zero it. If we look at the XML editor for the new drawing, we can see all the pin numbers are the same as the old drawing. So to fix it, we just have to rename the pins from 49 on. So while the pin's selected, we hit its ID and just change the number. Our pin IDs have been changed from 50 to pin 99. So we select the copper group of this drawing, then it's just copy and paste it back into the other drawing. The first thing we check is if this copper zero is inside this copper zero. So we go to our XML editor and look at the original copper zero group and at the bottom is our new copper zero group. If it's in another group, just indent it out, then stack it below the original copper zero group with the arrow keys, then indent it back into the original copper zero group. Now we have to position this group. Now we know from the breadboard drawing, this pin must be offset two inches from this one in the Y direction. So we select this pin, pin 24, and we see it's 16, 16. So we select our group again, our group border is touching the edges of our opposite pin, so the group coordinates are the same as the pin position coordinates. We punch in 16th hour for the X coordinates of our group, and now the pins are in line, and 2 inch 16th hour for our Y to get the right offset. Now it's a matter of going to our group, and object, ungroup. And if we look at our copper zero group, our pin numbers go from 0 to 99 in order. If you want this boundary box around the second group of pins, just scroll up to silk screen. This 120 object doesn't seem to do anything, so we can delete that. One way we can do it is select each object one by one, duplicate it, and then add two inches to its Y coordinate. This method is safer because it causes less problems later on. If we go back, the second method is to duplicate the silkscreen group. If it's not already, position this group under the silkscreen group, and then just indent it in. And this is what makes this method a little more tricky. This is due to two things, the parent-child relationship of objects in groups, and the transform modifier of a group. What happened was we duplicated a group with a 90 degree transform from when we rotated it earlier. And when we indented that group into a parent group, also with a 90 degree transform, the parent group added another 90 degrees to the child group. To fix it, we can select our new group and hit the delete button on the transform. And that'll put it back. Then we just have to add 2 inches to the Y coordinate of that group. The problem is the original group still has its transform. And if we deleted that in the XML, it would rotate. So to get rid of that without disturbing anything, it's object, ungroup, then object, group. The transform is gone, so now we have to put back the Fritzing identifier group name, Silkscreen. If you want, you can ungroup the new group to make it look more consistent. Because this has a lot of groups and objects, I'm going to temporarily group them before I paste them into the other drawing. Because if you accidentally deselect it in the other drawing while moving it, it's going to be hard to select them all again if they are separate groups. So we go Edit, Select All. We can see double dotted lines of the copper and silkscreen groups. So we go Object, Group. Now it's just a matter of edit and copy. Then back in our original drawing, it's just edit, paste in place. Now we have to position it accurately. From our part one breadboard drawing, we measured two millimeters from the edge of the PCB to the edge of the pin. But with a more accurate measure and adding half the pin diameter, we get 2.25 millimeters from the PCB edge to the center of the pin. It's about 1.9 to two millimeters from the edge of the PCB to the edge of a 0.6 millimeter square pin. So it's about 2.2 to 2.3 millimeters from the edge to the center of the pin. But the problem is the pin could be here, or here. And that's a problem when you measure a sample rather than having an engineering drawing. We could use maths to move it with the coordinates. The mass is 2.25 millimeters minus half the pin diameter ring minus half the distance from the pin ring to the pin rectangular box and that's 0.853 millimeters. But the other way to do it is click inside the dimension ruler and pull out a guideline. Hover over it until it turns red then double click on it then punch in 2.25 millimeters. Go to the snaps and turn off the grid snapping. Turn off snapping to cusp nodes and turn on snapping to midpoints. Then just grab our group and move it until it snaps to the guideline. And if we look at our X coordinate, it is the 0.853 millimeters we predicted. Now we just have to calculate our Y coordinate. 
Now we know our pins have to be in the center of the PCB, so there's equal gaps above and below. So we select our PCB rectangle in the XML and we see it's 66 millimeters high. Then we subtract from that the pin group height, which is 56.134 millimeters. That's 9.886 millimeters. Then just divide that by two, and you get 4.933 millimeters. So we punch that into the Y. And our pins are positioned correctly. Now it's just a matter of selecting our pin group and object, ungroup. And now we see our fritzing groups. All we have to do is move our PCB rectangle into the silkscreen group. But first we have to click on the silkscreen and see if there's a transform. It has one, so it's the usual object, ungroup. Then while it's still selected, object, group again. Then it's a matter of renaming our group silkscreen again. Now we can select our PCB rectangle, drop it one below the silkscreen group, and then indent it in. And it's part of our silkscreen group. We now check our copper 1 group, and it has a transform, so it's object ungroup again. And we see our copper 0 group has a transform. So that too, we object ungroup. Then while it's all still selected, object group, and then object group again. So you have a group inside a group. Rename the first group to copper 1 again, and the group inside copper 0. Now I need my non-connected support pins. Now I know my support pin has the same Y height as this pin, and is on the same 100 thou grid. It's just that it's 3.5 inches to the right. So we node select, select this pin, hold the shift key down, select the next pin, then it's edit, duplicate, back to arrow select, change this to inch, and just add 3.5 inches to the X. Then just edit, duplicate, and add 2.1 inches to the Y. And that's the support pins. You can select your ruler, click on the center of your first pad, grab the white ring on the end of the blue line and place it onto your other pin, select the inch, and it says 3.5 inches from round ring to round ring. In the PCB view of a part you don't see much text. I guess if it's a shield you won't see it if something's plugged in on top. But since we have a lot of text in our breadboard view, it's not going to be hard to bring it in. You can make text from scratch, but I'm not going to tell you how to do that here because it's fully explained in part 2 of this series, so go watch that. So for this one, I'll tell you how to get it off your breadboard SVG. If you were smart, you put your text in groups, then it's just a matter of copying and paste that into the other drawing. But if you've got a lot of text like this, you might be able to carefully box select it starting off the drawing. Make sure what you want is fully within the box because anything it cuts will not be selected. Hold the shift key down and carefully select the next group. Shift and box select the next group. And the last group. Then it's the usual edit copy. Edit, paste in place. Our text is white and is filled so we just have to hit the black button. And while the text is still all selected it would be a good idea to group it so it's easy to move around. So it's object group. Then it's a matter of trying different coordinates and moving it in position. After you're happy with that, just select your group. We see our group is level with copper zero, so we have to unindent that out until it's level with our silk screen. Then move it up under the silk screen and then indent it in. And now our text is in the silk screen group with the superfluous stuff. We see this group has a transform and you might be able to get away with it. I did a quick test of the drawing in a dummy part and it looked correct to me. But it's one of those things that's easy to fix now, but a lot of trouble to fix later if Fritzing doesn't like it. So while it's selected, it's the usual object ungroup, then object group again. Removing the transform in the parent group puts it onto the child groups. And I'm going to remove those transforms as well, just to be safe. I've removed my four text groups transforms. Now it's a tedious task of going into 100 text groups and removing the first instance of PX in the XML code. Warning, do the PX code correction last just before saving. Because if you move any of the text groups after, all the PXs will return and you'll have to do it all again. And that's it for our PCB drawing. Now it's a matter of just file, save as, plain SVG, save. Then we right click edit our part, go to PCB, then it's file, load image for view, select our drawing and open. Ignore the fonts, our text looks alright. All our pins looked assigned. We check our connector table and we can see a tick on every single pin. So we just file and save that. Then we select PCB view and try it out. It seems fine and we can even try connecting pins. In the next part we'll see more shortcut methods, a fully manually drawn method, more details about the fritzing rules and how to check the fritzing PCB output so we know the part works.